All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from an, actually a very sunny San Diego today. And I am delighted to welcome from Edinburgh in Scotland over in the UK, Mike Stevenson. How are you doing, Mike? I'm marvellous. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, and uh, and Mike, uh, as one journalist put it, um, if let me get the quote correct, if Mike's life was a film script, it would be dismissed as far fetched. Uh, expelled at fifty, no qualifications, uh, downward journey, homelessness, depression, drug addiction, swinging sixties, <laughs> swinging sixties in London, escaped to my hometown in Dublin, and became friends with probably the greatest. I would say hard rock band the world has ever has ever and probably didn't see enough of Thin Lizzy with Phil Phil Linus and Brian Downey, um, but you went on to you went on to build your your businesses and to become you know very successful. And what we want to talk about today is the concept that yeah we've been through a lot, but the best is yet to come. And let's face it, Mike, to some people that sounds like a well, it sounds like a bit overly optimistic because everybody's now expecting one crisis after another and the downward spiral to continue. Well, the most unlikely thing is this um, optimism is coming from a Scotsman. Um, <laughs> not normally known for, for seeing the world in a positive light. But I, I really do believe we're, we're at this tipping point now. And, you know, aside from the fact that young people have been brought up with different values, they see the world in a different way. They see climate change, for example, as an imperative, not something that we can plan long into the future. We need to do things now. And we've got the, the growth of artificial intelligence, the, the, the freedom that digitalization and the, the, the kind of positive globalization offers. And 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 also I think there's a there's a cry now to return to humanity. What I mean by that is, you know. When you go to work, whether you're at home, no matter what you're doing, you want to be treated as a human being. And I think sometimes we've forgotten that, you know, in the West. But, you know, when you look at some of the exploitative uh, labor things we've seen in places like Bangladesh and Africa and India, it's now an imperative. You know, people deserve to be treated with value and respect. Actually, I'll go back to an early, early experience I had when I was sleeping out in London. And it was very, very cold. And I was in Piccadilly Circus on this night. And I was really freezing. And this van drew up. And this woman jumped out of the van and she said, you know, we're from a charity. We're going to take you to a hostel tonight, put you up. And in the morning, we'll try and find you some more settled accommodation. And I thought, brilliant. So I, I get taken to this place called The Spike in Peckham in London. And... I was shown into this green tiled room and the first thing that was said to me was take your clothes off which i did and the next thing i knew there was a high powered hose pointed at me apparently this was me being deloused although i didn't have lice at the time and i felt that small and i, and I realized at that point that you know what i was looking for was not accommodation first it was to be valued to be to feel significant to be treated with a modicum of respect and even the idea that I might have dreams. And I felt that I was treated as a problem rather than, you know, someone who's got potential future. And, you know, that was a very early learning experience for me. And it gave me this feeling that we see a lot of this in the workplace, the way people are treated by services, the way people of a certain economic class perhaps of a different race or a different color, get treated quite routinely. And I think that's got to change. And I learned that at a very young age. And I have made it my, my principle that when I meet someone, when I'm in the company of anyone, I, I aim to lift their spirits, not sink them. So I, I think we are going to be entering a very, very exciting period now. And all these things are coming into play. All these things. And, you know, right. it it is really about casting off the old that doesn't work and welcoming in the new. And I think we're we're at the point now where we're just about to do that. And it's yeah. exciting. I think it's a, yeah, no, it is. And I think it's a great point about the, the humanity um, aspect that you just talked about there, because I think, 
Um, you know, prior prior to the pandemic, I think this was starting to happen anyway. I think people were getting more and more kind of disconnected. The more connected we got, the more disconnected we were, the more technology seemed to be overtaking our lives and all of that. I think the per uh, pandemic obviously uh, accelerated that to where people were like, okay, I really need, I really need human connection. And to your point, I really need to 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 feel to feel like I'm somebody to feel like I have a place in this world. I'm not a, I'm not a statistic. I'm not just a, a a you know an employee or whatever. But I think I think there's been a reawakening, not just in young people, but I think even people of our age group. Absolutely, yeah. I'll tell you that the the thing I always say: if you don't go out in the morning with a sense of purpose, all you're doing is something routine to fulfil a role. And I had the best, I saw the best demonstration of this in South Beirut. And I was over there because my mother was Lebanese and I had an aunt who was dying. So this was in 2006 and when there'd been a relentless bombing of South Beirut. I mean, this was relentless, you know, missiles being fired, the kind of thing we're seeing in Ukraine just now. And the first day I arrived, it was only two days after the bombing and I went down to South Beirut. And it was mayhem. There was rubble everywhere. And, you know, unless you've seen a war zone, you don't get the real sense. It's not a picture. This is real. You're breathing in dust. Uh, people are walking around with ghostly faces. Um, you know, you see all these accoutrements of life buried under the concrete, cars flattened. And in the midst of this mayhem, there was a guy on top of the rubble selling clothes. And I said to my the guide I was with, I said... Um, that's very entrepreneurial. Two days after, you know, this whole place has been bombed. And he said, that used to be a shop. So I went up to the guy and I said, must have been horrible to lose your shop. Because that's what we think, isn't it? Yeah. And he said, I, I'm not a shopkeeper. I give people silent confidence. So, and I thought, wow, you know, that he saw the shop merely as a vehicle for his purpose, not the end in itself. And, and I think we've seen some of that during COVID where, you know, great restaurants, um, you know, they turned to, you know, providing uh, food in ice boxes so that people can prepare it. They provide recipes. So they would, you know, they would define themselves as not as a restaurant, but as purveyors of, you know, fine foods or, you know, they are to tantalize people's taste buds. So I think that that was a real demonstration for me that if you are running an organization and you don't have, you know, people who share a purpose, um, rather than just a job description, then you've just got people coming in for a wage. And that's mm -hmm. that's a low bar to set, isn't it? Yeah, no, I and I would agree. And I think there's a I think there's a fantastic opportunity here because I think a lot of people, and again, I think this was happening, I think this is even started happening after the financial crisis, as people started saying, why should I live in a high cost area just to be close to this office building because yeah. guess what the minute there's a crisis or a downturn who gets laid off i get laid off now i have yeah. a high cost of living in a place yeah. that i didn't really want to live in in the first place so yeah. people yeah. are moving out and finding where they want to live and getting a job second and thankfully with the a lot of people can do work online so it's becoming even even yeah. even more simple to do but i i think people are now voting with their feet yeah Absolutely. And, you know, you look at parts of the highlands of Scotland, which, you know, beautiful mountainous landscape with lochs and small islands. Mm -hmm. And they are now slowly being repopulated by people who might have a job in the city of London, but they don't have to be yeah. in the city of London. So they can sit with a laptop and have a quality of life, which they could never have dreamed of and earn the same amount of money. Um, you know, that's that's extraordinary to be able to retire early if that's what they want to do. But they're, they're investing in the local community. So it's actually spreading, you know, the wealth out of the, the city clusters where all the wealth seems to be concentrated. And that's got to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's a great thing because I, I think the whole idea of, uh, I mean, we have it here, like if you go up to Los Angeles, the whole idea of this massive urban sprawl and people crammed in on top of each other and all of that, it's not sustainable. 
And yeah. I think anything that helps us to re repopulate, spread out, and, you know, I mean, let's face it, in the U.S., I, I can't remember what the statistic is, is like 70% of the land is uninhabited, which is, which is bizarre, but there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I think I wanted to ask you about also is uh, the fact now that we have things like Upwork and all that, where we can find expertise all over the world. So, like, I mean, I can have a guy in, you mentioned Bangladesh, I mean, I can have yeah. a guy in Bangladesh, highly mm -hmm. qualified, highly educated, who can do work for me and then he's contributing positively to his local community yeah i mean I've, i think this this is a huge opportunity the you know it used to be that we built um cities around rivers um because the water mm -hmm. was the essential source for all industry and and all sort of infrastructure developments but and now it's broadband and of course broadband can be you know we can send fiber optics, you know, in any remote part of the world. I mean, even somewhere like Rwanda is one of the most, um, you know, connected countries in the world because the, the Koreans, South Koreans went in and did a deal with the government and they've got fiber optic broadband, you know, throughout the country. So villagers in Rwanda are able to do um, sales businesses. They can grow things and they can sell them directly online. So it is opening up and that can't be a bad thing at all. And, you know, I suppose we'll see some city depopulation. There's no question about that. Um, I think London, people are moving from London to Manchester if they're under 30, because under 30 see Manchester as the, the young people's city. So we're already seeing things beginning to split up. And I think it's... It's 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 a great it's a great thing because this heavy concentration of wealth in you know small geographical areas um, is quite exclusive, and it means that people in rural communities are live in poverty. Yeah, and and actually, uh, when when satellite internet uh, really matures, and that's coming soon, that is going to reach all those places that can be reached by by you know by fiber optics, etc. So that's going to be a game changer too. It's interesting yeah. you mentioned Rwanda though, because if you say uh, you know the best is yet to come, I think Rwanda, you know, and people who are saying, oh well, look at all these crises. I mean, Rwanda is a great example of a country that went through the most horrific oh. horrific experience. But has emerged strong, reconciled, yeah. which is amazing, and and is no. now one of the success stories of Africa. Absolutely, and the fact that you know neighbors were killing each other, yeah, and Brutally. they gave they forgave their enemies after all this was over. This, um, I mean, they did it in South Africa as well, um, mm -hmm. but it, it's an extraordinary thing to be able to redeem a country that you would have thought was effectively split in two factions and it would never ever reconcile and they did and of course the focus now is on you know growing the economy and becoming an innovative country not just you know a mimic but being innovative and you know um building up different kinds of industries there so it is a success story and it's a it's an ambitious country yeah. Um, but as we see often in in the West, and we see in the in the so-called developed countries, that we kind of we're we're sort of trying to cling on to very traditional ways of working, traditional ways of constructing a business or a company, and and I think the ones who are going to win are the, are the win are the ones who say, okay, that's not going to happen anymore. It's going to be a hybrid. It's going to be innovative ways of business, and we're going to get the best people wherever they are. Yeah. Well, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, you know, the world then becomes a meritocracy, um, yeah. which is the oft used word, which, uh, it, you know, there aren't many meritocracies, really, um, not in the purest sense, but it, it is. And you look at countries like Estonia as well, which is, mm -hmm. um, you know, becoming a real success story, you know, after, you know, coming out of the Soviet bloc. I mean, I must be feeling very insecure now um, <laughs> with what's going on in Ukraine, but, you know, these countries, you know, Finland, with the best education system of the world, you know, um, the healthiest country in the world, and it used to be, it used to have a worse cardiovascular record than Scotland, which was something, <laughs> and it's now the healthiest, and they've transformed their education system, because these smaller countries are very nimble-footed. They can see, you know, We've got to transform our education system and they will give it to someone to take that responsibility. It doesn't have to go through, 
you know, endless committees. They don't have to do lots of research projects. In fact, I could tell you now, we're not doing kids favours. You know, I I wrote yesterday about the fact children don't play outside anymore, which is one of the, the problems uh. with the structures we've got. You know, I was out, you know, seven hours a day during the holidays. Um, now, I don't know if you saw the research recently, but on average, kids are out, you know, around the world for one hour a day playing. This is unstructured play. And, you know, prisoners get more time outside. So, <laughs> you know, then we're sitting in classrooms that are based in the industrial revolution model. Yeah. Um, you know, sitting in rows and we're, we're kind of cramming in. It's all about memory and testing. And, of course, uh, you know, learning is much more dynamic than that. I learned more in the year after I left school than I had in the previous 15 years. You know, mm. just by living. Just by living and exploring and, and, you know, having this endless curiosity and always wanting to find out about things. That's why kids learn, you know. Mm. And uh, it, 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 we do suppress their creativity, I think. And, you know, creativity is going to be the, the most prized human attribute um, going forward. Because it's not just being an expert at doing something. It's finding new angles, finding new ways to do things, creative solutions that no one had ever thought of before because we tend to follow the tram line until someone mm. comes up and says, wait a minute, we don't have to go straight ahead. We can go, you know, to the right, a bit to the left. We can go over, we can go under. And that's the kind of thinking we need now. And we're seeing it. Let's be let's be fair, particularly in the digital world. Yeah, and and I agree. I mean, and I think, uh, and I think the generations coming up now, they have, they're kind of, in some way, they're unfettered in their thinking because they think everything is possible because they've been born into a world that's so, everything is so easy and dramatic and like yeah. you know, they yeah. got their phones and everything. So I think they have yeah. a different. Yeah. They have a. They don't have the same kind of ceiling that we artificial ceiling that we had for ourselves. The other thing I just want to come back on, I just mentioned, yeah. yeah, or you just mentioned about kids playing outdoors, yeah. But like you know, I mean, probably same as you when I was growing up. You wouldn't be allowed to hang around the house. You'd be kicked out oh. onto the street and say, "Go play here. Yeah. Have a stick and a ball. Go on." <laughs> no reason to be at no home. I mean, you you know, you come back for food, obviously, yeah, and sleep, um, but. Mm -hmm. It was unfettered freedom, you know, to to commune with nature, to, to play, to to invent things, you know, to meet girls. I mean, you know, it it, it was that's mm -hmm. how you learnt, and it's where you got your resilience and and your ability to withstand criticism and all those things. Um, and of course, sporting as well. You know, you you move, and uh, you know, we 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 now run the risk of our head just being trans transported by our body as a means of transport. You know, our whole body is us, not just our brain. Yeah, no, I I, I totally agree with you. And I think, so I, I, I do think, I mean, I agree with you. I think that, I think for, even for the kids, it was, it was, I mean, I saw it in my own area here, it was good that the kids on the streets started playing together during the pandemic in a way that I'd never seen before. The young kids, because they were kind of forced to, and now yeah. they've continued it, like they run up and down the street and all that, the way it used to be. Yeah, so I'm hoping again, that if we, if we can combine that zest for socialization and freedom with their, obviously, you know, their technological, uh, yeah. you know, uh, now that they have, we really have a good future ahead of us. Yeah, I, I think that's something that's going to change. I think um, we'll find ways of providing security. You know, we've got we've got drones, we've got you know CCTV cameras. We'll find ways of making sure our children are safe. You know, when they go more than four yards away from the front door of our house, mm -hmm. um, and that's essential now. We've we've shut down children's lives because of the the appalling risk of or the risk of something appalling happening in fact it's very rare but it just takes one case and one set of parents to be be made to feel guilty for the rest of their lives that they weren't watching their child all the time and i think that's that's an awful burden to carry but i think we're we are changing now and you know yeah yes it's, no, it's no, a, i, I I agree. I agree. It's 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 a it's a it's a great thing, and I think it'll only get better. Um, before we finish, one one last question I just want to ask you is: um, so when you were when you were at your lowest point, right? 
what is it that kept you going or what was the what was the what was the hope you held on to or and to to actually help you get out of it because if there are people listening who are you know maybe they're not in the same situations that you were but they're feeling a little lost or a fit, bit hopeless what, what was the thing that kept you going and and kind of persuaded you or or encouraged you to to keep fighting well it's a mix of bloody mindedness mm -hmm. because you, you you know i wasn't going to be defeated I wasn't going to let those people that criticised me, the teachers, the head teacher, who threw me out of school, I wasn't ever going to allow them to be right. That was one of the things, just sheer bloody mindedness. But I think the other thing is that it gave me a chance to think, because when you're at your lowest point, there's only two ways to go. You know, one is down, inexorably down, and that means death. Um, yeah. The other way is up. And I saw this... You know, I wanted to make small improvements every day. Just do something every day. I even went to the, the Beatles' Apple, Apple studio when I was homeless and asked for a job. And I had a 30-minute you know, chat with, with one of the, the managers there. I was hoping to meet George Harrison, actually, but I didn't. But I, I developed this kind of um, confidence because I thought, you know, one thing you learn when you're homeless, actually, is if you don't ask you don't get. And I'm not talking about begging. I'm talking about mm -hmm. you're really hungry. You go to a fruit market and say, look, I'm starving. If I help you, you know, carry these crates over, will you give me some apples and oranges? You know, so you get into this creative thinking as well. You know, how am I going to survive today? Um, and I wanted to know all the streets as well. So I know central London, like it's the back of my hand. And, and I would become a tourist guide because people would always stop and ask. And even got to know the, the restaurant's menus. Uh, so I'd be able to recommend restaurants to people. Of course, they give you a, you know, a couple of quid. So it, it, it was about learning and, you know, seeing every day as an opportunity to learn and just building up your own confidence by speaking to strangers, you know, doing something that stretches you. And when you start stretching, when you just make those little steps forward, you get an adrenaline rush. And so it goes on. And I was on that journey for about 25 years, just every day, you know, adding something to my toolkit, to my knowledge base um, and to my confidence. Because, you know, when I was a small child at school, I was just one of those children that, you know, everyone feels sorry for. I was looking down at the ground. Um, mm. I thought I was hopeless. I was treated as hopeless. I was bullied. So going from that to where I was, you know, 10 years after I left school was quite an extraordinary leap. And, you know, I say to you know, young people that the, the plain looking people at school, they'll be the really attractive ones when they're older. And the bullies, they're the ones walking around with fear in their eyes when they're older. So, you know, it's, it's about conquering those things that have defeated you. That's the first thing. And then it's about building day by day, taking little steps that increase your confidence and your ability. And also, you know, gathering a sense of purpose, a sense of purpose. And I, my purpose really is that I don't want children to, to suffer before they get a chance to, to flourish. And, you know, we routinely shut down lots of children's opportunities just simply because of the postcode or the, the zip codes or who their parents are. And I think that's wrong because we're, we're wasting so much untapped talent. So I want to see the talent brought out of all young people. That's my purpose in life. Wow, that's um, that's fantastic, Mike. Uh, and, I, and I agree with you. And I think the whole education system, the way we, do, you know, we, we treat kids and everything, that needs a complete overhaul. Um, yes. But listen, this is great. All of Mike's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Mike, do tell people a little bit more about yourself, what you do. Well, now, I, now I'm a speaker. Um, and I, I speak about creativity, about innovation. I, I'm described as a motivational speaker. It's not a description I like. But I do you know, have this ability to energize and lift and inspire, give people's ideas and, and the confidence to go off and make things happen. So I do that as a full-time living. I had a, a marketing and design agency for 20 years, did really well on that. 
loved it, had some of the biggest corporate clients. Um, and in a sense, that was a, a kind of gathering from all my earlier experiences. I knew how to sell because I had to sell myself when I was sleeping mm -hmm. out. And I don't mean that in the in the yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. marketing sense, but you know, all of that learning went into setting up business. But the recession came along and that got that got me. You know, um, so I had to shut that company down and I set up again. So I'm I'm a speaker now. Available yeah, fantastic. All across the world. Yeah, no, fantastic. And as you said from the intro, and go check out uh, MikeStevenson.net because you will uh, you will read his whole story there and he's got media, uh, got clips and everything. And I'd highly recommend, I mean, we need more people like Mike who can – who oh. can who have come from the experiences that you've come that can you know help lift other people you know yeah. lift other people out of where they are and maybe encourage people to look at the world a little differently and what we're doing yeah. with the with the generations coming through so thank you very much mike for today my uh, pleasure thank you for watching and listening and i'll see you all again soon yeah.